morning, let's take our hymn, we'll turn hymn number 194. Hymn number 194. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5 of this song. There's five verses here. Uh, so we're going to do three of them. 1, 2, and 5. Let's stand as we sing. Y'all sing out this morning. It says, Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been you so much for taking care of that. Um, anyway, I hope you all had a great week. Um, 
I've got just a few things to share with you before we continue on in the service this morning. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the preaching hour. Even before I do preach, I would uh, really appreciate any private prayers that you would lift up on my behalf. Um, I, I've really got something in my heart today, and I hope I'm able to get through to the hearts of God's people. Um, anyway, um, there's going to be a VBS, the final VBS staff meeting tomorrow night here at the church at 630. So it's very important that you make it to that. Those of you that are participating in this year's Vacation Bible School, which is going to be on August the 1st through the 5th. And then there is a list of uh, kitchen needs for VBS out in the foyer too. If you'd let us, if you could sign up for that, if it's something that you can bring and supply and let us know what it is that you will be bringing, that would be greatly appreciated. There's more information about those needs in the bulletin here. And then tonight, uh, if you come back, you won't, you won't have to listen to me again. So that should be a further incentive for you to be in, in attendance tonight. And I do hope you will. Maybe you're not, um, it's, it's not your general habit to come back on Sunday night, but uh, the young people are going to be uh, sharing with you what God has done for them uh, at camp this past week. And Brother Joe and, uh, uh, pardon me, Jack Oryx and um, Tim Sharp will be sharing with you as well and participating. They were the two sponsors that went down this week. I really want you to come out and listen to them and show your support uh, for them by your, your presence here tonight. And then just one last thing. Uh, I've been thinking about this and uh, praying about it for the last couple of weeks, but next Sunday I want to take a special offering at the end of the service. You can be thinking about it uh, for, the, for the Leach family. Uh, they're a missionary family of ours. We support them monthly. I, I know in uh, their correspondence and so forth, uh, when you know their daughter Rachel recently passed away and went home to be with the Lord probably about three weeks ago now, and they said concerning the funeral in lieu of flowers, if, if anybody wanted just to contribute some money to help with the funeral and expenses because things are extremely tight uh, for these missionaries and we, I, I just want to be a blessing to them and minister to them. So be praying about what God would have you to sacrificially give next Sunday uh, for the Leach family. And uh, I, see, I see a couple of faces I don't recognize. Folks, it's good having you all here this morning. Thank you uh, for coming our way. and. Uh, God bless all of you for coming our way today. All right, brethren, if you would, go ahead and come. We'll receive uh, the Lord's tithes and offerings today. And as we prepare to do so, I'm going to ask Brother Randy to ask God's blessing on this offering. Brother Randy. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. What a fellowship what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. 
What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. from all the loves leaning oh leaning leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. from all the lives leaning oh I am leaning leaning on the everlasting leaning on the everlasting arms on the everlasting leaning on the everlasting
206. 206. O's faith, but I'm glad. Let's stand and we'll do all four verses. It's a short song. Uh, let's stand as we sing. Y'all sing out once again. O say that, but I'm glad. <laughs> Well, we're going to be uh, looking at five chapters today. <laughs> I, just, I just do that to scare people. It is the truth. We're going to be looking at Job chapters 38 to 42 today. Um, I have... Uh, there's no question in my mind that God wanted me to preach on this today. There are three types of sermons that I preach. At least this is the way that I categorize them in my own mind. Uh, sometimes when you sense a need within the congregation, you want to address it through the preaching of the Word of God. So sometimes the sermons that I, I construct are sermons that I feel like you need. The second kind of sermon is the sermon that I feel like I need. And then the third type of sermon is the sermon that we all need. Um, I mean, there are times when there's a few things that I'm not struggling with in my life that I feel like maybe somebody else is. I don't think that I'm any better than the rest of you here. Um, I go through the same struggles, but uh, our struggles are, are different. Um, and so I, I, I preach on what you may need. I preach on what I need, uh, which maybe in your mind is a bit selfish. 
Uh, but as I do preach uh, on what I need this morning, I, I do invite you, and you are welcome to listen in. And I hope you will do so, because I do think it's something that we all need. I want to talk to you this morning about the final examination of Job. Uh, I've shared a few sermons in the book of Job with you, and now I'll skip to the end of the book. Uh, but right now in my life, what I'm going to be speaking on this morning, particularly the point that I want to make at the end of this sermon, is what I need more than anything else, more than anything else in my life right now. I need a clear vision of something. And uh, I, I got to tell you, when I finished my initial preparation of this sermon, uh, again, not to uh, scare you too much, but I had probably about 15 pages of notes. I had to do some heavy editing. There's a lot of things that I've left out that I really didn't want to leave out, but, uh, you know, if I'd have preached those 15 pages, the Methodists would have beat you to lunch. And uh, we don't want that. We're Baptists, man. We like to eat. Um, but anyway, before we look at the message this morning, uh, I'd like to just pause for a moment of silent prayer, and then I, I will pray. So let's bow for prayer. Ask God what, we, what he would have you to do this morning in your own heart. Dear Father, I just pray for one thing this morning, that through the preaching of the word of God, you would magnify, that you would magnify yourself. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Um, I think y'all, for the most part, know what 38 to 42 is all about. All through the book of Job, Job feels like maybe he's been mistreated, misread, certainly by his friends. He wonders that why God's doing what he is allowed to be done in, in his own life, Job's life. And so throughout the book of Job, he's been crying out for an audience with God so that he could come and plead his case. Sometimes I think we feel like we've been mistreated and not just by other people, but by God. And we desire to plead our case before God, too. This is nothing unique to Job. There have been times when you and I have gotten mad at God, asked why to God, and in many other things that we'd rather not entertain or even think about. I came across a quote by uh, a guy, his name is Christopher Morley. I think he had a good assessment of one of the main things that he saw in the book of Job. He said this, he said, uh, and I, I think, I think he's, he, he reads the mind of Job pretty accurately in this statement. He said, I had a million questions to ask God, but when I met him, they all fled my mind and it didn't seem to matter. You know, right away, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to be able to read all the verses in these chapters, right? That alone would keep us here for quite some time. Uh, I'll only uh, use a very few verses. But I, I, need, I need to give you the data in those chapters so that I can make the point that I want to make at the end. And oh, it is a point that I wanted God to make with me and impress upon my own heart. And I desire that for you this morning. Right away, when you, when you in, in, in 38.1, Job 38.1, right away we see God uh, begins to speak to Job out of the whirlwind. And the answer to Job's problem, and they get this, it was not uh, an explanation about God that was needed. That was what Job's friends uh, tried to do for him. But he didn't need an explanation. He needed a revelation of God. This is important. Uh, it, it's, 
it's going to take more effort for you to stay with me until the end when I make my point. So give, give it your best this morning. Uh, but what he needed, Job needed more than anything else, was a revelation of God. When God displayed his majesty and greatness, it humbled Job and brought him to the place of silent submission before God. And that was the turning point in Job's life. Experiencing this majestic demonstration of God's power, it made Job very susceptible to the message God had for him. So God speaks to him out of a storm, out of a whirlwind. That had to be pretty intimidating in itself. But God's address to Job centered on his works in nature, and it consisted of 77 questions interspersed with divine commentary relating to the questions. The whole purpose of this interrogation was to make Job realize his own inadequacy and inability to meet God as an equal and defend his case. Job in Job 13.22, as I hinted at before, had asked God for an audience to defend himself, and God has now responded to Job's challenge. Uh, so God is going, uh, God's address can be summarized in three questions, and let me kind of give you a basic outline of the, uh, of the chapters before you. Um, first of all, God asked Job, can you explain my creation? Secondly, can you oversee my creation? And then in chapter 40 comes, comes Job's first response, and then in chapter uh, the latter part of chapter 40 on to the end of chapter 41, you find God's third question. Uh, not only can you explain my creation, can you oversee my creation, but can you subdue my creation? And then in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, you find Job's second response. And uh, we'll scan through all of that. And I really want to get uh, just a little bogged down there at the end of chapter 42. So the first question that God has for Job is, can you explain my creation? Uh, this takes place uh, in this interrogation, uh, takes place in uh, chapter 38, verses 1 to 38. You know, Job was very sure that his speeches uh, up until this point had been filled with wisdom and knowledge, but God's first question put an end to that delusion in Job 38 too. When God asked him, he said, who is, that, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, why are you using your ignorance to deny my providence? God didn't question Job's integrity. He didn't question Job's sincerity. He only questioned Job's ability to explain the ways of God in the world. Job, in the end, spoke the truth about God, however, thankfully. You see that in chapter 42, verse 7. But some of his earlier speeches uh, lack humility. And so that's what we're dealing with here. Job thought he knew about God, but he didn't realize how much he did not know about God. Have you ever realized that? got some folks here that have a good handle, a good grasp of the Word of God, but I feel like there's much that I know about the Bible. I've been studying it and reading it since I was age 13, but i got to be honest with you, the more I learn about God, the more I feel like I don't know about God. And, um, you know, knowledge of our own ignorance though, folks, is the first step to true wisdom. Well, anyway, God began with the creation of the earth in verses 4 through 7, and this is where I need to move. I'm leaving out a ton of material. Uh, he begins to talk to Job about the creation of the earth, and then secondly, the Lord, that he moves to a consideration of the seas in verses 8 through 11, and the image here is not that of a builder like when he created everything, but the, the seas were, quote, unquote, knit together in secret and then burst forth like a baby emerging from the womb. 
And then in verses 12 to 15, the next aspect of creation that God mentioned was the sun and the heavenly host. And here God pictured himself as a general commanding his troops, and not only the sun, but the heavenly host. And then the next 11 questions appear in verses 16 to 24, and they relate to the vast dimension, uh, dimensions of creation. You know, the average child today knows more about the heights and the depths of the universe than Job and his friends could have ever imagined back in their day. Had Job ever taken a walk in the depths of the sea and visited the gates of Sheol? No. Did he know how far down he had to go to find the ocean's floor? We know about the Mariana Trench. It is uh, 6.78 miles deep. As far as we know up to this point in time, that's the uh, deepest uh, area anywhere in the ocean. Almost seven miles deep. Job didn't know anything about that. And, and as for the reaches of, of uh, space, I heard Brother David Ellinghausen elaborating on that in Sunday school class today. And of course, if you've been watching the news today, you probably heard... Uh, some news about the Webb telescope and you saw pictures of some uh, uh, that were uh, some pictures that were taken by the Webb telescope. Uh, the Webb telescope has a different technology. It's an infrared, uh, it has an infrared resolution and sensitivity to it and it, it can see a lot further than the Hubble telescope. In fact, get this, the Webb telescope can see out 13.6 billion light years. I don't know if you realize this about the Webb telescope, but it's suspended up and way up, you know, miles up into the atmosphere uh, beyond the gravitational pull of the Earth. It's not something that's mounted here uh, on, on the face of the Earth, but uh, it's up in the heavens there. And, uh, but it can see 13.6 billion light years. And as I was watching the news, I saw some very uh, extremely interesting photos. You see, light has a very close relationship to time, and actually some of these photos they took were so far out that they were, uh, they were from the past as far as time goes. Um, But the thing that one of the scientists said, and I mean, you know, you know all about the galaxy that we live in. Uh, we're the third planet out from the sun, right? I think, yeah. And, uh, you know, you got several planets that form our what? Solar system. And... Uh, and we know all, all about our part in our immediate galaxy. And our galaxy is millions of miles wide. The Webb telescope looks out into the heavens and the statement that I heard on the news is that from what they ob had observed, there was no doubt in their minds that there were billions I didn't say thousands, I didn't say millions. There are billions of galaxies out there. It's more than my finite mind can grasp. I mean, it's overwhelming. So in verses 19 to 21, God asked Job if he could calculate the reaches of east and west. Or if the horizons were too much for him to measure. Could you? Do you know how far it is from the east to the west when there are billions of galaxies out there, many of which are much larger than ours? And then God inquired if Job understood the heights where the snow and the hail were stored until God needed them, or the places where God kept his lightning and winds. And then you come to verses 25 to 28, and God asked Job, says, how much do you know about the rain? Did he know how to plot its course so that it would accomplish God's purposes? Could he tell the lightning uh, where and when to flash? Uh, was he able to fall the rain and 
uh, do so that the land would have the water that it needed. Then God turned from the spring and autumn rains to the winter hail and frost in verse, verses 29 to 30. And if Job didn't know how the rain was fathered, how did he understand how the ice was born? So God's just hammering away at Job. And by this time, Job was probably wishing for a reprieve, but the Lord kept right on. He centered Job's attention on the heavens. Did Job understand the laws that governed the, the movements of the stars and the planets and make them appear in their proper seasons? You know, man may study the heavens, but he can't control them. Creating all things is one thing, but maintaining them for man's good is something quite uh, it, it, is, is quite something else. I'm reminded of what it says right there at the beginning of the book of Hebrews. How God through Christ created the world and all things are upheld by the word of his power. And then the, more, the Lord moved to the next series of questions about his providential working in the world. He moved from the inanimate world to the animate world. So we come to the second uh, topic uh, that God wants to entertain with Job and that as I said before is this can you not only create can you oversee my creation like I say I'm, I'm just I'm throwing out a lot of data to you I hope I don't lose you because the point at the end of the book of Job is extremely powerful and impactful but can you oversee my creation? Uh, this is discussed in chapter 38, verse 39, all the way through the end of chapter 39. So the Lord brought before Job's imagination a parade of six beasts and five birds. And as he contemplated these creatures, Job had to answer the question, do you understand how they live and how, they and, and how to take care of them? And obviously Job had to reply, no, I don't have any idea. In his wisdom and power, though, God supervises the whole universe and makes sure that his creatures are cared for. In fact, God runs the whole universe with such uh, precision that we are able to build our scientific laws upon it. Now, I've shared this before, but I want to share it again. Some of you may have forgotten. Some of you were not here when I shared it before, uh, there is no doubt in my mind, I am fully convinced that uh, the God of the Bible exists. All right, yeah, I know, we, that's something we ought to amen to. Uh, note that I said that I am fully convinced there is not one shred of doubt anywhere in my mind and soul. You say that's impossible. I would, I would uh, want to debate that with you. Because my faith is a reasonable faith, and there are many reasons why I've exercised my faith in God and in Jesus Christ. Legitimate reasons. But I, I just want you to consider one thing. Do you all know how far it takes uh, for the earth to revolve around the sun? How many miles does it travel in order to make one circuit around the sun? 92.96 million miles. I have often said that in, in my mind, one of the greatest evidences for the existence of God is the calendar. Do you wonder why I say that? Do you know how long it takes for the, for the earth to revolve around the sun? Yeah, I know, 365 days, but we need to be more specific than that. 365 days, 5 hours, 59 minutes, and 16 seconds. Again, 365 days, 5 hours, 59 minutes, and 16 seconds. Every single year, the same time, the same amount of time. 92.96 million miles travels that distance for uh, the same amount of time 
down to the very second. Oh, the evolutionary process is controlling it all. Doesn't that sound idiotic to you? Man, I, you, you know there is a God that is controlling the pace. I mean, when you go over uh, into the millions of miles and it travels, you know, over the same span of time to the very second every single year. Job, can you do that? Randy, can you do that? Daniel, can you do that? Ronnie, can you do that? I'm not going to ask Barry. I know he can't do it. I, I can see the look on his face. He, do, he doesn't want to try. <laughs> I can't. Then in verses 39 to 41, did Job know how to feed the lion cubs or the young ravens? Did, did Job know about the gestation periods for the goats and the deer and how the young are born? Uh, how do the little ones grow up safely and how does the mother know when they are ready to leave home? The wild donkey, by the way, verses 5 to 8, roamed in the wilderness freely and refused to be domesticated. It survived without human assistance because God taught it how to take care of itself. And then you consider the wild ox which is the unicorn. Uh, uh, it was another loner in the animal kingdom there in verses 9 to 12 of uh, chapter 39, refusing to yield to the authority of man. And at this point, God asked Job, if you can't succeed with these animals, how do you expect to succeed when you meet me in court? How strong do you think you are? Now try to put yourself in Job's shoes and imagine this is happening to you. You got problems in your life and you're blaming it on God. And God, I doubt your wisdom and I doubt your power and I doubt your justice. You and I have all been there at some point in our lives. And we think we want to tell God about it. Be careful what you wish for. Then God turns to a description of two birds in verses 13 to 18, the peacock and the ostrich. And God asked Job, uh, he didn't ask Job any questions in this paragraph. He simply reminded him of the bizarre anatomy and the behavior of the ostrich and suggested that perhaps Job could explain it. I mean, the peacock has beautiful wings that are very serviceable, but all the ostrich can do with her wings is fan the air. Can't fly. Why did God make a bird that couldn't fly, but that, listen to this, could run faster than a horse? Now, you're probably going to want to go home and research this to see if I'm telling you the truth. Now, the ostrich, the, the, the average speed of an ostrich, I did the research, is, is around 35 to 40 miles an hour. The average speed of a, a horse at full stride is 55 miles an hour. But an ostrich for short stretches of time can get up to 60 miles an hour. Of all two-legged creatures on the face of the earth, the ostrich is the fastest. In fact, every time it takes one stride, it covers five and a half yards. God made, made him. And then he goes in verses 19 to 25 to the subject of the horse, an animal that was greatly admired and valued for strength and courage. It was God, not Job, who made the horse with the strength and ability uh, it needed to face danger and to serve effectively on the field of battle. And then the parade ended with two birds, the hawk and the eagle, in verses 26 to 30. Who gave the birds? the instinct to migrate, um, and the knowledge to build nests. Not Job, but they know how to do it. Nobody tells them. God gave them the instinct, though. Eagles build their nests high on the cliffs, but God gave them such keen eyesight that they can see their prey uh, from great distances away and swoop down and capture it. Well, you come to chapter 40. 
And you get Job's first response there in verses 1 to 5. God uses language that reflected Job's desire to take God to court and argue his case. Because in verse 2 of chapter 4, you find these words. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that re reproveth God, let him answer it. All right, Job, I've, I've said my piece for a while. Now you respond. You've had your doubts about my power, about my wisdom, about my justice. Now keep in mind everything that Job's just heard out of chapter 38 and chapter 39. Put yourself in his shoes. God's talked about all the things that he has done with his power and his wisdom. And says, Job, can you match that? I mean, Job can't begin to match it. So God presented this case, and now he gives Job the opportunity, but Job has to present his case. But you know what? Job has no case to present. He thought he did. Now he doesn't think so much. The first words from Job were this, Behold, I am vile. Which means I am insignificant and unworthy and I have no right to debate with God. Ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, until we are silenced before God, he can't do for us what needs to be done. Be still and know that I am God so that you can hear the still, small voice of God when it comes to you. Be still. And I'm saying to you this morning, and I am not backing off, uh, because this is primarily for me, secondarily for you, but I'm saying be still. God's presence is in this sanctuary we came here to worship, and it's time that we knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is God, and there is none else. You may think you're important, but you don't match up. You don't begin to match up with God, and neither do I. As long as we defend ourselves and argue with God, he can't work for us. And in us to accomplish his plan and you know to accomplish his plan through us. But Job was not yet quite broken, and at the place of sincere repentance, he was silent but not yet submissive. So God continues his address in chapter 40, beginning at verse 6 through to the end of chapter 41, and he wants to discuss this third topic: can you subdue my creation? <clears throat> Instead of confronting Job this time with a broad sweep of his creation, God selects only two creatures and asks Job to consider them. It is as though God were saying, my whole universe is too much for you to handle. However, here are two of my best products. What can you do with them? The issue now is not so much the power of God, but the justice of God, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Job had said that God was unjust in the way that God had treated him and in the way that he failed to judge the wicked. So basically in verses 9 to 14 of chapter 40, God asked Job, do you have the strength and holy wrath that it takes to judge sinners? If so, then start judging them. Humble the proud sinners and crush the wicked. Bury them. You claim that you can do a better job than I can of bringing justice to the world, so I'll let you do it. However, before God turned Job loose on the sinners of the world, he asked him to put on his majestic robes and practice on two of his finest creatures. Um, I believe in my studies that Though different words are used, and people have conjectured a lot of things about uh, 
the two beasts that are named here, I believe what, uh, and, and most of the Bible scholars believe this too. I found this out by studying for the message. Uh, the two animals that uh, God puts before Job here is the hippopotamus and the crocodile. So, assuming it's the hippopotamus in verses 15 to 24, uh, I mean, most students, as I say, would agree that this is the hippopotamus. There are some that have said it could be an elephant or a water buffalo. The word behemoth is the translation of a Hebrew word that means super beast. And today's big game hunter, uh, with his modern weapons, would probably not be determined or deterred by the hippo's size or strength, but uh, this beast was a formidable enemy in the days of arrows and spears. So God asked Job, can you capture and subdue this great creature? If so, then I'll believe that you have the power and the wisdom to judge the world justly. And then in chapter 41, he deals with the subject of the crocodile. You find the word Leviathan. And it is the transliteration of a Hebrew word, uh, the root of which means to twist or to writhe. You know what a crocodile does. I don't need to tell you. When it pulls its prey into the water, it begins to twist and turn. Right? I mean, you've seen that in nature documentaries. Um, so God is asking Job, can you capture the Leviathan? And if you can, uh, what, will you, what, what are you going to do with him? I mean, it's a little too much to keep up with. I mean, God's, you know, in Sunday school class, David was talking about the vastness of the universe and then Tina Soul's I mean, we're talking about billions of stars out there. Tina Souls made the comment, and uh, you, you know what? The Word of God says that God has all those stars named. That's just one little minor thing that God, I mean, he, he just, one minor thing, he remembers all the names of the stars. But he created everything, he controls everything, he subdued everything, he oversees everything. Now Job just asked to, hey, can you deal with a hippopotamus and a crocodile? There is such a great difference when it comes to greatness between God and man. I mean, what are you going to do with a, cra a captured crocodile? So God drew a practical conclusion. If you can't come to grips with the crocodile, how will you ever be able to stand before me? And in verses 26 to 29, God named eight different weapons that the Leviathan laughs at and treats like pieces of straw or rotten wood. Now that's basically the content of verses 38 to 41. What are we to make of it? That's what you find in verse 42. And here we receive Job's second response. And I've said everything that I have said to lead up to the point now that I want to make. It is the point that I needed in my life. You know what? I think every believer needs this. And you'd best listen to the word of God today. I am pressing hard. I admit it. Job knew he was beaten. There was no way he could ar argue his case with God. According to the passage, Job humbled himself before the Lord and acknowledged his power and justice in executing his plans. There in verse 2, you see that. And then Job admitted that his words had been wrong and that he had spoken things that he didn't understand. So Job withdrew his accusations that God was unjust and not treating him fairly. And I want you to hear this statement. Are you ready? Are you listening? He realized that whatever God does is right and man must accept it by faith. Whatever God does is right. 
and man must accept it by faith. Job had met God personally and seen him himself. Uh, seen himself to be but dust and ashes compared to God. I love what Charles Spurgeon once said. The door of repentance opens into the hall of joy. And this was true of Job. He's repenting now, ladies and gentlemen. And not only that, but Job, the servant, became Job, the intercessor. God was really angry with Job's three friends because they hadn't told the truth about himself and they had to be reconciled to Job so that he could pray for them. So Job became the umpire between God and his, th- and, and, and his three friends. And by forgiving his friends and praying for them, I said, by forgiving his friends and praying for them, in case you didn't hear the first time, by forgiving his friends and praying for them, Job brought back the blessing to his own life, the blessing of God. Is that worth remembering? We only hurt ourselves when we refuse to forgive others. And that is something that I have seen in my years of the ministry. At times I've seen it in this church. An unwillingness to forgive. I'm being blunt now, aren't I? You know, by and large, I've got to say, and praise God for it. I, I thank the folks that I'm looking at here this morning. Your hearts are in the right place. And if I didn't mean that, I wouldn't say that right now. But it is something that I've had to deal with in the past and something that I have to continue to deal with at times. The lack of uh, a person, uh, person's willingness to forgive others. And it just wrecks their life. Job said, I can't be guilty of that anymore. Well, because Job responded to God in a way that pleased God, Job ended up with twice as much as he had before. Y'all knew that. He's got 20 children now. He's got 10 in heaven. He's got 10 at home. He and his wife have been reunited. Friends and relatives have brought money to Job for a restoration fund which Job must have used for purchasing breeders, and eventually Job had twice as much livestock as before. And in the end, Job, as the scripture says, died old and full of days, which was the goal of every person. It means more than a long life. It means a rich and full life that ends well. That's the end of the story. I like happy endings, don't you? You can have have a happy ending as well if you'll do what God wants you to do with your life and be the person God wants you to be and to be Christ-like as possible. So this is my conclusion. And this is what I needed. I'm just like you, same emotions. I have my good days and my bad days. I'm wondering, though, is there some of you here this morning and you're all bent out of shape? Things in life are not going the way you want them to go. And you want to take it out on somebody. And because of that anger and bitterness is beginning to eat away at your life, and not only that, Uh, but you've lost sight of living by faith and responding to every adverse situation in a Christ-like way. In fact, at the end of the day, you want to place your blame at the doorstep of God 
And that leads to another problem. You have begun to lose sight of something else, and that is God himself. To be sure, you now find yourself exactly where Job once was. You, like Job, have begun to doubt those three things about God, the power, wisdom, and justice of God. And if you ever needed Job 38 to 42, it's definitely right now, just like I did. If you were to go to God and accuse him of not knowing what he's doing, uh, because of what he has allowed in your life, you would no doubt get the same sermon Job did. The greatest need in the lives of some right now, and I mean those of you who are ruled by anger and bitterness, and those of you that are yet now unconverted to Christ, and those of you in the midst of a deep and prolonged trial, you more than anything near, need a clear reminder of the greatness of God. That has done more for me than anything in a long time. It is changing my life. And I went looking for it because I knew I needed to be reminded. Right now, at this stage of my life, I needed to be reminded of the greatness of God. Because problems come my way, problems come your way. And I don't just deal with my own problems. It's, it's just when, when the folks of Calvary are having problems, I mean, that weighs on my heart too as I'm sure it does for many of you who care about your brothers and sisters. And the ministry is not a job that you leave at the office. It stays with you all the time. The heartaches, the challenges. And I wanted to be reminded of the greatness of God, and boy, God met the need. You know... If you get a clear vision of the greatness of, is everybody listening? I mean, really listening right now. I'm not getting eye contact from everybody. I'm sorry to be so forceful or blunt this morning. This is so important. Do you realize what a clear vision of the greatness of God would do for you? I look at Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. You know what it says there in verse 27? By faith Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured having seen him who is invisible. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And then in verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what happens when you see God in his greatness and glory. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives of the river of Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber. Uh, out of the midst of the fire. And then verse 28, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. That's how people respond if they get a clear vision of the greatness of God. When's the last time we had that kind of a response? That was the question I've been asking myself all week. Then John, the beloved disciple, Revelation chapter 1, 
verses 13 to 17. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like a defined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. A clear vision of the greatness and glory of God. If this church ever gets that, it will revive this church in an instant It will transform this church in an instant to the point that it will no longer be recognizable to anything you've ever seen in this church in the past. I believe that with all of my heart because I know what it's doing for me right now and a lot more needs to be done. Pray for me. I wonder... I wonder what would happen, by the way, I'm on my last third of a page of notes, so I want you to continue to focus right to the end, okay? I wonder what would happen if when we concluded the service and made our exit out to the parking lot, we were met with a giant stationary tornado. Would that get your attention? I'll tell you what else would get your attention even more. If from that tornado you heard God speak and he said, I am God and there is none like unto me. Imagine it. See right out there. Huge tornado. I am God and there is none like unto me. If we ever experience that, at least four responses, I am convinced, would come from each one of us. First, as saved and as sanctified as we are, we would realize just how far still we are from the glory of God, how far we fall short of the glory of God. Secondly, Any doubts that we ever had about the power of wisdom and justice of God would quickly fade away. Thirdly, every concern about our finances, every concern about our health, every residue of hatred and uh, bitterness would be gone in an instant. And fourth, we would confess that whatever God wants from us, we are willing and ready to submit totally to him. The greatness of God. Can you see it? Lord, I pray that you would bless this message to the hearts of the hearers. And and Father, if these dear people are anything like me, they're conviction needs to be found in the heart today because I'm sure every last one of us in this building have chronically underestimated your greatness our finite minds struggle with truly understanding just how great you are that affects our lives it affects how we respond it affects how we live and it, it affects the quality of our lives Lord, today I pray that you would humble us as you humble Job and help us to see thee more clearly. There are some today that need to be saved. And one day they're going to keep an appointment before the Almighty. What will they say? What will they do? There's nothing they can do. But there is something they could do now, and that is come to Christ before it's too late. And Lord, what about the rest of us that know you? 
There have been times when our attitudes haven't been right. There's times when we have doubted your power and your wisdom and your justice. We've taken it out on you. There are times when we have underestimated the greatness of our God and we have lost faith and become discouraged. Lord, I pray that you would heal us of that today. And may you glorify yourself in these final moments when the invitation is extended, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hymn number 270, I believe, just as I am. If God has spoken today, if you would like to be saved before it's too late, come to me and let me know your need. If God's spoken to you through the message today and there's some things that you need to talk to God about, confess to God, to repent of before God, this prayer altar is open. I hope that you'll come and do business with him today. Whatever the need, would you respond as we stand to sing hymn number 270? <laughs> Before we sing the third, are you sure there's no one else that needs to join up here? Some of you that have trouble getting around, I know you're probably doing business with God in a pew right now, and uh, that's fine with me, but if you need to do business, uh, would you do it? Having entertained more about the greatness of God this morning, I wonder if there's someone yet in the pew that would come and say, Lord, I rededicate myself to thee. If you feel like you need to do that, we want to extend the opportunity for you to do just that as we sing the third stanza of Just As I Am, if you come.